Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us and for donating part of your Saturday to what I think is a really worthy discussion. We're talking about below-the-line diversity, um, the crew people, the people that actually make the movies happen, and how do we um, increase the access points, the, the pain points, and, and what we can do to improve it. Um, we have a tremendous group of panelists, and I'm going to let them go down the line. If you guys can introduce yourself, give a little background, and then also uh, tell us what your first entry point was. How did you get in that first door? This works. Hey, my name is Kongyu. I'm the co-producer of Searching, which is currently in theater. You can still check it out if you haven't. Um, Mm, how I entered the business. I went to USC, I met the right person and right on, yeah. And and worked on my first feature film with uh, with my mentor. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Carlos Rosario, um, costume designer. Um, my latest movie that I design is The Girl in the Spider Web, uh, coming out in November. And uh, the way I got in the business is um, uh, mostly, you know, my background is mostly in fashion. Uh, I came to Los Angeles mostly as a tourist, and I always say that um, I'm not the one who chose being a costume designer, it kind of chose me. Uh, somebody said, why don't you just get in the union? And um, I never had any experience in the movie industry. Um, so um, I had some drawings that I presented, and I was accepted, and that was my... Uh, my entry in the business, the president of the union then in the Costume Designers Guild became the, um, one of the designers on Batman and Robin and he really liked my work and two weeks after you know, getting in the union uh, he remembered my work, he called me and he asked me if I wanted to start doing the drawings for that project and so that's how I got in the movie industry. Hi, my name is Joy McMillan, I'm an editor. Um, I edited Moonlight, an upcoming film, If Bill Street Could Talk. Um, I guess my foot in the door was going to Florida State Film School, um, and that's where I met Barry Jenkins, so. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Bowers, <coughs> and I'm a composer. I uh, have a few projects coming out, one um, called Green Book, and uh, another one called Monsters and Men, it comes out September 28th, and, uh, and a film that's actually playing here tomorrow called uh, Bethany Hamilton, Unstoppable. Um, but uh, I got into this industry, I guess, I, I always wanted to. I was mainly a pianist, a jazz pianist, and um, I just kind of talked about it all the time. I just would always tell people that that's what I wanted to do. And um, uh, this woman that was my manager for like a three months or something like that happened to know a director and introduced me, and, um, and that was my first project, yeah. Hi, my name is Eddie Perez. I'm the stunt coordinator for Shameless. Uh, we're on season nine right now. Uh, the way I got started is I came out here to visit a friend, actor Isai Morales, and he was doing a film called La Bamba. And uh, it was kind of the start of the Latino movement in films. And they asked me to kind of help out and work on the film. And then it turned out to be a motorcycle that no one could ride and I could. And from that, Taylor Hackford did another film and called me. and. I wound up staying, and uh, 25 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we're there's a lot of conversations right now, which is fantastic, about diversity in front of the camera, about representation, and obviously that's a conversation that, that needs to happen that's long overdue. Um, but I think that this conversation that we're happening, having now about diversity behind the camera is, is less often talked about. Um, do you guys think that it's as important as what's represented on screen, and, and why? Any order. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, again, when I first got started, uh, Taylor Hackford had done, he directed Blood In, Blood Out, and did La Bamba, and it was the first start of really Latino films for Los Angeles. And I had a conversation with him recently, because he was the president of Directors Guild, and when the films first got started, they asked him, well, where do we find all these Latinos? And he was like, go to all the theater companies in Los Angeles. And like, well, are there that many for the film? And he went out and kind of started the movement. So I think it starts, you know, with film festivals and everyone putting out all their work. And from that, 
we come out and shine as everyone is here. You know, I just want to say that for, for me as a costume designer, I wish I could hire more crew that represents um, more of the diversity that there is in America, you know, and have those minorities represented in my crew. But um, the challenge that I have is that it's still a very, very white, white industry. And, you know, I always felt that the more uh, diverse my crew is, I think, um, you know, you'll be able to have a deeper and stronger creative process, you know, with all these different voices that work together towards creating something. The problem is that I'm not able to bring, you know, um, that diversity in my crew. So the question is, you know, um, you know, I wish I could incorporate more Latins in my crew. I wish I could incorporate more African Americans. You know, it's a creative department. So, you know, we are not choosing people based on the color of their skin. We choose people based on their artistic and creative qualifications. Um, so that's a really good thing. But, you know, um, I wish I could you know, bring more of that diversity in my crew. Um, and the question is, why isn't there more of that? And I'm just wondering if, um, I was thinking about it this week, if, you know, the white population in America is way much more privileged than minorities. And I'm just wondering if, since this is a creative, um, you know, job, if white people have more the opportunity more want to make the risk of taking the leap of going into a creative job as opposed to somebody belonging to a minority that might not feel like they have the opportunity to fail because they don't have the support of their family. So that is one aspect. And also the other aspect that I, that I thought about it is that it's just the people at the top of the pyramid are still very, very white. And although I think, and we're talking about this, that you know, all of us need to work together towards creating that diversity, um, I think you know, the people at the top of the pyramid, you know, the white men that are in charge of this industry, really need to set the tone and open the doors to more minorities. You know, so we can all kind of like reflect that. You know? I'll add on to what Carlos was saying, which was fabulous. Um, one question we uh, we get asked so often, like more than necessary, is why searching has an Asian American family, and our answer is really just why not? You know, you know, you have a, it. Really, can be any family: black, Asian, Hispanic, white. Uh, that's the beauty of the story, and you don't have to. When we premiered at Sundance, John Cho said something that's really touching. He said. It move, it's, it's incredible for him to see a family looks just like his, especially the father. <laughs> um, that's not dysfunctional. That's just like any other family in this country. And the same applies to behind, be, behind camera. You know, like you said, this is what America looks like. It doesn't make sense that everyone is straight white male. And it, for me personally, it wasn't until I worked on a TV show for NBC and our showrunner, um, two of them were lesbian, um, so queer women, and they made a very, very conscious choice to hire female people of color, queer if possible, um, department heads. And other than the location department, which is incredibly difficult to find women, <laughs> we had all female department head on that show. And it wasn't until then I realized how different it is. You don't get interrupted. You don't get talked <laughs> down. People listen to you. Uh, everyone talk slower, more um, methodical. Uh, so it's just a different environment. It wasn't until that happened that I realized, wow, this feels so much better. This is a much better way to work <laughs> with more people from diverse background. Yeah, I also think it, it's important because it normalizes it. Like the fact that somebody still responds to searching and it's like, why are there um, Asian American people in this in this movie, I feel like you know I've I've had conversations with people where I say like, um, here are two people that are working on this project and they're black people and they're like, 
Like, oh, so it's a black movie. I'm like, no, like, wait, what? Like, why? Like, why? First of all, why'd you say it like that? And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that being said, like, it's, I think the more that it happens, the more that nobody's going to, like, question it or look at it like it's weird or, like, feel weird about it, the more that we just do it and normalize it, just, like, because there are people that look like us that live in this world and exist day to day like everybody else, it makes sense to have us a part of that project and, uh, or the, that process in that way. I know a question that I often get asked is, um, you know, I was the first African American female nominated for the editing Oscar, and people are like, "Why did it take so long?" And I'm like, "I think you're asking the wrong person." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> you know? it's like, yeah, so it's it's. I think it's like shining a light on the lack of diversity and highlighting that you know it is something that we need to be better about. Actually, you know, this, this morning I was reading a few articles online and it seems like in 2007, 2010, minorities were about 28% of the American population. And they're saying that in 2060, it will be 56 to 58%. So the minorities are going to become the majority. So it's important for, you know, I've always felt that everybody has their eyes on this industry. And it's important that we set the tone and we show everybody that, you know, this industry can represent the society in America. You know, um, even though I am an immigrant, I've been here for 25 years, I really, it's very important for me to, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am right now if it wasn't for America, so I'm very grateful. I've always felt supported, you know. Uh, but I think it's my job also, my responsibility to, um, you know, allow that diversity to be seen, you know, in our departments. How do you guys think that having diversity behind the camera affects the actual finished film or show or episodic something? How, how does it affect the stories that get told? Different perspective. Like our, uh, all the shows I've worked on, we have the writer's room is always diverse, people from different backgrounds. Of course, people's input would be different than a room full of I don't know, white male from Santa Barbara. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's true. I've worked you know, a little bit on location all around the world, and I've seen that the more the diverse your crew is, the stronger the creative process is, the more fulfilling and nourishing the creative process is. When you work with a crew that is very linear, you get a very mental process. When you get to work with people that have roots in every kind of you know, different, direct, different cultures, you get to have a product that's way much more interesting and fulfilling. And also I feel like, you know, for example, Fede Alvarez was my director on The Girl on the Spider Web. He's from Uruguay. And you know, th the reason why I think it just was such um, a, a thrilling, you know, exciting experience to design costumes for that movie, it's because you know, we kind of are, we have the same sensibility. You know, we speak the same language. He would say one word and I know exactly where he's going. So I think in that sense, it's always exciting to be able to work with, um, you know, just people that are from different cultures because it really helps your creative process so much more. Can you think of any specific instance where you and the diversity you're bringing to a project affects um, the way that a character is costumed that maybe somebody with it from a different perspective wouldn't have? Well, I think it's something I always feel like the creative process kind of is something that happens very organically. I think there is always a flow that happens and you need to be kind of in alignment with it, you know? Um, so I think in that sense, I think it's just kind of like a container that you need to be part of. And the, the substance that the crew represents is what is gonna support your creative process. So the more you have that diversity and that depth, the more you're gonna be able to find something that is way much more exciting, you know, as opposed to something that, you know, a crew that might be more, um, you know, just very white, then it becomes a very mental process, you know, in which everybody knows what they have to do. And I think the, the essence of that creative process is lost a little bit. Anybody else? Anything from your specific area of, yeah? Well, uh, last, uh, let's see, Fast and Furious 8, we shot in Cuba, and I'm part Cuban. So they brought a lot of us there that are 
never been there and so I got to see our heritage. And it was interesting to work with all the Cubans there and they saw part of us and saw what we do. And it was a great just mix of culture. It was like they understood what we do, how we do it, how they do it. We've all become friends now and we stay in touch. We get to see their creative process and now some of them are doing short films that are coming to the country and we're able to communicate. So it's, it's really when you have a culture like that that has been so closed off and we go back as the expatriates and communicate with the people, it's, it's a really nice feeling and it made the working process easier because they didn't fight us as much because they understood and there was a communication because there was a bond there, a cultural bond. So I think in some senses that's really important. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just worked on a project that, um, that I found that happened because um, it was a, a series about these young black kids in, in Liberty City, Miami, and, um, and they just had as their temp just like a bunch of hip hop music, even in moments that like felt like, um, like more sensitive moments or more like tender moments or whatever, but they felt like they had to put this sound in there because like that's what these people listen to. It's like, yeah, but at the same time, we can like have some of those or elements of those sounds, which true, yeah, yes, these people do listen to that music, but at the same time, like, there's still, we still want to like show the, um, the the human aspect of what's happening in this story, you know. And so I think that like being able to step in with that perspective and and be able to say that like, uh, you know, try to find a middle ground, I guess, between like representing that community in a way, but not just like showing them as as as. Um, uh, I guess like as general as like some of these people think that they might be. You know. Specificity of character. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Carlos, you brought up a really interesting point, which is that everybody on this panel has gotten to a place in their career where you guys are department heads and you're hiring. Um, can you talk about your experiences as a person of color, as a woman, about how you approach your hiring process? Me? Uh, I definitely... <laughs> would like to, you know, have a, as diverse crew as possible. I just think it contributes to the working environment, to the story and the result of the project. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate because it's not easy, like you're saying. It's just, there are very few Asian, well, there are a lot of Asian filmmakers out there, but uh, compared to other ethnicities, there are quite a few. And I will, we now start a bunch of groups that we meet regularly. And I think right now it's a great time after, you know, Crazy Rich Asian, after what they call Asian August, I think that's <laughs> right. Crazy Rich Asian and then searching. Um, and how two years ago people were hashtagging and starring John Cho and now it's finally happening. Um, I think it's a really good time, but, um, but it still needs a lot of improvement. And also, like to give you a funny story, I work with this production coordinator a lot, and whenever we want to hire office peer, I would be like, hey, let's bring on an office, you know, Asian office peer. And he would think, no, then our whole department would look Asian. It's too Asian. I'm like, what does that even mean, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, for me, um I mean, again, you know, if I work in America, um, you know, I, I obviously I, I would want to, again, hire a, a more diverse crew, but again, it's just very tricky to find, you know, to find, um, you know, that diversity and, you know, have those minorities represented in my crew. I mean, I'm used to work on location all around the world, so, you know, I can only bring sometimes one or two people from America and then I have to work with actually the people that are part of that country. So in that sense, in our department, you know, we're always been very open to work with other cultures. I think that's been really easy for us to do with whatever, you know, crew we find um, in, you know, foreign countries. Um, you know, I don't think that's where the problem is. I think that we're able to, you know, when we bring the crew from America and we work with, you know, the, the foreign crews, everybody mixed together and we're able to make it work. You know, the problem is mostly in America. How do we find that diversity? And I think it's not just in our department, but you know, in the choices that we can make when we need to hire people. But it's also at the top. Like for example, I was, you know, I was reading something about Gael Garcia Bernal, who was saying, well, where, where are the, the Latin American directors? Mm -hmm. 
you know, like he was, he couldn't think of one. He said, yes, there is Guillermo del Toro, there is Alfonso Cuaron, there is Iñaruto, there is Fede Alvarez from Uruguay, but where are those directors, you know? And I think that, you know, there are some African-American directors, but not enough for, you know, for how, you know, built America is, the way America is built. So I think that, you know, it needs to start at the top of the pyramid. There is so much I can do from my side, you know? I mean, we spoke about that earlier. I think it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that we all need to fight um, in our own little worlds, you know, because I feel like America, Americans tend to just give a little bit too much, of, too much power to the government. And I think that everybody needs to take responsibility for, um, you know, for, for their lives and, 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 and see what change they can do in their work environment, yes. But I think, you know, uh, the people that, you know, are part of that 1% and the heads of the studio and the investors really need to set the tone, you know. And then I'll be at the bottom of the pyramid really helping that process. Yeah, I think like access and education are two of the things that are very important in like making, you know, below the line more diverse because, you know, for me, it was like, you know, a lot of times I was the only in, you know, in a cutting room. And a lot of times, like you were saying, you would like to ha hire a more diverse group, but they're not presented to you because they're not available. And so one of the things that I try to do is not only, you know, and who I hire and make it more diverse, but I also try to have access to more like assistant editors that I can offer up when an editor reaches out to me looking for an assistant. Um, and there's a group of girls of black female editors that I mentor because a lot of them have been out here for a while but just didn't have access to getting into that cutting room. And so, you know, by introducing them to, you know, a, a wider, you know, group of editors and getting them that opportunity to be in the interview chair, you know, is actually providing them the opportunity to be counted among the ones. Yeah, I, I totally agree that about um, just uh, education and mentorship and, and access. You know, I, I, I went to, I was in the jazz department at Juilliard and I was like one of four black kids in the jazz department. Like that seems very strange <laughs> to me. And it, but it was also the same in high school. I went to an arts high school here in LA and I was probably one of three black kids in the jazz department at high school. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that like, you go to a lot of these schools in, in those communities and they're like, their, their music education is, is incredibly non-existent. If it's getting cut in California in general, it's definitely like, it, it had already been cut there a long time ago. So they're taking the kazoos now at this point. So <laughs> I think that, um, you know, like it's really also, yeah, just about like showing for, for a lot of young black kids, like showing them that it's possible. You know, I think that I meet so many young, <clears throat> young people of color that like don't even think that you can have a, like, making music is your job, like what does that even mean? They, I don't think they even think that that's a possibility. So I think that like showing them more and more um, what the possibilities are and, and yeah, just trying to like uh, talk about education as much as possible, for sure. Um, I'm kind of in a different situation, which has been good because of my work is on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, my department's kind of been affected a little bit sooner, whereas we have something known as nondescript which is when you have a bunch of people, let's say you have 10 people getting out of the way of a car or some, an explosion is happening. I was able early on now to bring, let's say three or four women, blacks, Hispanics, and do a mixed culture, whereas 10 years ago, that would have been probably fought a little. It would be like, well, how many do you have in there? Well, do we need that many? You know, now, now it's like, it's okay. Well, well, who do you have? Oh, you have girls, great. We want more girls in there. So I think the on-camera thing, because my department, yes, I'm behind camera, mm -hmm. my work is up front, it's changed a bit sooner. I mean, it still has a long ways to go, but again, by some of the Hispanic kids and seeing us on camera, mm -hmm. they realize they can do it as well, so now there's more and more people coming in that want to get started. And do you feel like you have a good pipeline, like you've got enough people that you need? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's, there are, but specific stunts, there's still a lot more to go. Car driving, motorcycle racing, you know, it's an expensive sport. So it's still something that certain things people have to work on and ha we have to create that environment mm -hmm. because when you f try to find the stunt double for certain things, sometimes you can't find 
the person that fits the person and you have to, as you know, doing wardrobe and everything, you have to use a man for a woman because it, it's a hazard, someone can die. So you have, to, you have to bend a little, which is very hard, but you have to for safety. But I think in the next four or five years, you're seeing people come up and that'll, that's changing. But again, it's a cycle of change, I think, as we all have in our departments. People are coming up now, but it's gonna take four or five, six years for that change to happen. Joy, you brought up something really interesting about the union piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you think that plays into um, the pipeline? Yeah, because like a lot of the unions that you have to be a part of to get a job on a lot of these films or television shows, there is, you know, there's the hundred days that you have to get in, you know, to become an editor's guild. I think to be an AD, it's like 600 days. You have to work on all these sets, and then there's a dues that you know becomes a part of that and so it's like access money and being able to afford to be a part of these guilds is also one of like you know one of the barriers i think it is for people who don't actually can, you know can be a part of it um for the, the people who are either ia or sag i know sag yeah, is uh, heavily involved yeah. in diversity yeah well sag is very heavily involved and when you sign your paperwork now they're making sure that all the everyone's checked as to who they are and how, and they're following the numbers very carefully. I mean, also the studios have put out notices whereby, especially in television, the certain ethnic group has to double a certain ethnic group for a stunt, unless you can't find that person. I know Warner Brothers is very big on it, and uh, Fox has followed suit, and now all the studios are doing that as well. They're, they're very much on top of it. I've had a, recently had an issue on a TV show where they said if I couldn't find the person to double the right ethnicity, they were gonna change the actor. So that was a first, you know? And, and it, it was not a good situation because I'd hate an actor to lose a job because of it, yeah. but it was a skill that had to happen and it worked out. But they were very aware and very on top of it, which was something I'd never seen before. That's the, the top of the pyramid, right? Yeah, that yeah, you were saying. Yeah, they were very much. And what about um, the, the local IAs? Do you feel like there's any um, like mentorship programs, diversity programs that are trying to bring up young people? Um, the America Cinema Editors are actually doing a really good job of like um, putting these like, diversity mentorship programs um, in place that are now allowing people who you know, want to get into post-production to have access to editors or assistant editors that are working in the field and allowing them to like make those contacts and then you know which is making getting into those cutting rooms a lot easier and also the motion picture editors guild is doing that as well so yeah so one thing that i've noticed is that um getting getting in the door is one thing becoming a department head becoming a key becoming part of the, the main creative force of a film is something entirely different. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of thirds, there's a lot of seconds mm -hmm. um, that are women and people of color and not as many department heads. Well, what do you guys think is the barrier there? I'll say for me, um, you know, I had been out here for probably like 10 or 11 years, like trying to get my foot in the door as an editor and a lot of times like the interview process would go really well and then it's so funny because I don't think a lot of the producers notice when they would call and tell me um, that I didn't get the job. They're like, yeah, you know, we worked with him before or, you know, he's so good. And I'm like, oh, I see who I'm losing out to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then so it literally, you know, took Barry, you know, making me an editor on Moonlight um, was huge for me and at the time you know it was just me working with a friend and you know trying to do my best job possible and then all of the you know stuff that came with that afterwards was quite surprising um and then a lot of times people i remember like my co-editor on moonlight nat um is a white male and so a lot of people would ask us like our trajectory of getting where we were and um Again, I would get asked the questions of like, oh, well, Nat did quite a few future feature films before you. Like, why do you think that is? And I'm like, again, wrong person asked that question. <laughs> I was like more than ready to work on a film. I just wasn't being asked to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like making that jump from assistant editor to editor is, you know, it can be 
very hard, and I think but shining a spotlight on the lack of diversity is now making people want more females and more people of color in um, post-production. Yeah, I've been in that position many times. Um, you know, I mean, I think as, as an immigrant, like I said, I've, I've always been very welcomed in this country. So that's the good thing. But, you know, I've faced the challenges as an immigrant that, you know, probably every immigrant has to face. But it's nothing specifically to, you know, to, to the movie industry. Where it has been really hard for me to break through is to find the right people that actually um, understand what I'm about and who I am. And I think that I've been really lucky to find these few directors that actually we have the same sensibility. And it's not necessarily that, you know, they are from Europe or they are from South America, because I'm all French, half Spanish. Um, but, you know, um, I, I've been working with this, you know, American director, Brad Anderson, who, you know, really enjoys working with, always hires people that are, you know, kind of a little bit more edgy, a little bit different, you know, from Europe. He knows that by hiring people that are from different cultures is gonna make his movie way better. And he enjoys that process. But I've really had a hard time also kind of um, getting my foot in the door because I've always felt that because it's a white industry, white directors would, I think, relate much more to white costume designers. You know, and I think it's the same way when I was working as an illustrator, as an assistant. I mean, I think that it took me, I've never felt any kind of discrimination, but it definitely was harder for me to get jobs because in this very white industry, including in our department, all the white people would want to work with white people. And it's been always hard for me to kind of get in, you know. So you felt like the, the thing that turned it was having directors that you just really connected with? Yeah, I think it's about, yeah, me just finding the key that allows to open that door um, to work with directors that understand what I'm about, you know, and that not necessarily, you know, choose their designers or their crew based on, you know, uh, the country they're in or the language they speak but most importantly on you know, the person that they think is the right person for the job. And that comes with any color, any language, any background, anything. And even, not even being a well-established designer, you know, they could easily go to the big designer, but they felt that me, in the beginning of my career, would be the right person for the job. You know? So I've always appreciated that from them. Yeah, I feel <clears throat> similarly about like getting to know the person just because I feel like there's so many people that, um, you know, my agent has reached out to pretty frequently for me to do like hip hop music for stuff and like, and that's a very small part of the kind of music that I create and, and um, that just shows that they're not taking the time to one, listen to the music that I create or like, or, or even have a conversation with me because I found that, you know, one of the first people that really gave me an opportunity as well was Justin Simeon, the creator of Dear White People. And, and with him, you know, we were able to talk about all of the, uh, my taste in film, which is like really heavily influenced by like foreign film filmmakers and directors and a lot of um, uh, films that use like silence and like things like that. And we talked about our taste in music and things like that. And so like once you actually have these conversations and get to know somebody on this deeper level, you can trust them with your your with your vision to be able to like execute in the right way. Because otherwise, if there's not that conversation, then I feel like people will always stick to whatever stereotype they have of you in their mind, and so they'll see me and be like, okay, well, I like I'm just gonna ask him not to be weird, like to do the thing that I think that he thinks he can do, you know. So yeah, like, I think that if we can just have these conversations and talk, then we'll be like, oh wow, like you're actually into the same stuff I'm into. Like I would love to have you work on my film, not you know assume that we're into whatever you think the last black person you met was into. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah for me it was a, a little different because uh, most of my work has come from, I did a lot of short films with directors at USC and people like David Goyer and Don Murphy and those guys as they moved up in ranks brought me along. So I, you know, I, I may have had some of those challenges but 
a few of them, you know, sometimes said, oh yeah, that's right, you're Hispanic. And somebody would say, hey, you got a Hispanic stunt coordinator. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot you are. And we <laughs> laugh about it because we've been friends for so long, but now it's become more apparent than it was before. Before it was just like, oh, Eddie's working with us. Is now it's like, check the box. You know, so do you like, I mean, do you like that? Nah, I, I have, you know, I have a little issue with that. Yeah. yeah, because now I, you know, the diversity thing, I appreciate that we're trying to do it, but I think it comes from people like that are here mm -hmm. rather than making a point of being diverse. I mean, we're all individuals, everyone is. Mm -hmm. And that's important to know. That's where we all come from. And that's what filmmaking is. Everyone brings something to the table. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're forced it, it can change things that, you know, there can be a little bit of pushback. Yeah. So that's where we have to be careful in that. Yeah. And just to add on to what everyone was saying, like, I think film is an art form, but also commerce, very much so. Um, and being from China, I witnessed how Chinese box office contribution kind of changed how Hollywood makes its movie, like yeah. the Meg. Yeah how they cast a big Chinese actress, probably because they have Chinese money. But the fact that, quote unquote, diverse movie, Moonlight, um, Searching, Crazy Rich Asian, are doing so well box office wise, I think it's a really good sign. So it's people, investors, who really just want their money back, see that um, <laughs> these movies can be as prolific as any other movie. Yeah, I guess, I guess the hope is that someday they're just stories. Yeah. They're not yeah. black stories, they're not Hispanic, yeah. they're not Asian. They're just stories about all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that we don't have to have this conversation. Right, that we don't, have, we don't have to make a point of it. <laughs> that, you know, Crazy Rich Asian is an Asian movie film. It's about a family and people. And I think there's always been movies about different cultures. Mm. But I think there is a different type of awareness now where we have to be proactive about supporting those type of movies so we can create more diversity in our industry. I think the intention is different now. I think before watching all those movies, but there wasn't any kind of like energy behind it, you know, any purpose, any intention. Now there is, because like you said, it makes money. You know, I think Black Panther was the perfect example. There is a market for that. You know, it's, it seems so obvious. But, you know, for Marvel to get to that stage to do a movie like this with an entire cast that is African-American, I mean, you know, it's really a big deal. And for that movie to be such a big success is, I think, a gift for this industry. You know, it opens the doors to so many, so much more than that, you know? Because of that, both Marvels and DC, they just attach their first ever Asian-American uh, directors. Kathy Yen and Chloe Zhao. So it's, it's improving, definitely. So let's talk about, um, there's been this huge push on the above the line, the talent in front of the screen, the directors, producers too, I feel like. Um, I, I so wish I had statistics on this to share with this group, but I, I don't. But I think, I don't know if you guys would agree, it seems to me that when you have um, a person of color or a woman in either the producer or the director slot, it, there's a tremendous trickle down effect in terms of the keys that they're hiring and then the people that they in turn hire. Do you guys agree? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, it, so is it enough to have the conversation about above the line and let that be the driver and let the trickle down? Or, and if not, how do we build the other way up? I think it has to come from everywhere. I yeah, think yeah. everybody has to do their little job on their side and, and make a difference, you know, and take responsibility for, um, you know, creating a better society in the future. So if all of us, when we get to this kind of, you know, more powerful positions can make a difference, each one of us in our little corner, then I think slowly it will make a difference in the big scale. I don't think we should just expect always the producers and the actors and the directors and the heads of the studio and the investors to do that. I think all of us mm -hmm. need to make that difference, you know, um, on each project. I, I think the above the line is a sell, obviously, because that's the faces you see. Mm -hmm. But again, it's up to us here and everyone on the crew to bring someone up and help mentor people. Mm -hmm. Mentorship is a great thing, you know, and, and being out there, being places like here and putting yourself out there 
to let people know that you can do it as well. You know, a lot of times going into the inner city schools, I go sometimes, you, you, they're not aware that they can do what we do. And you just open, when you open a nine-year-old's mind to that they can do it, that's where the change happens. It has to start early. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, by all of us doing this, we're opening people to change. We've, oh, yeah. I was just gonna say that also, it's true that when you have a woman producer, these days, it really makes a big impact in the way the crew is hired. There is no doubt about it. It was a very, very white, middle-aged man industry. <laughs> it still is, but you know, the intimidation, the bullying, you know, what I've seen in the 90s, it's not there anymore. And I think it's just because women slowly are getting into those powerful positions and they're actually setting the tone for a different way of working. I think there is an openness in women that I haven't seen in the past with men, and they're more inclined to bring more diversity into the crew. Are there any, um, we've talked about a couple of them with guilds, are there any other specific programs that you guys know of that are mentoring young people who are interested in um, below the line positions? I think the Emmy Committee is doing some, a few things. I know they do quite a bit, the Directors Guild is as well, and the Producers Guild all have programs. And, and um, the Grammys as well. I know yeah. the Grammys oh, do like right. Grammys in the schools and things like that. And, um, and, and also uh, there's a group of composers that have started something called the Composers Diversity Collective. Um, and I know that that's one of the things that they just started a few months ago, but I think that's one of the things that they're focusing on trying to do as well. DGA has AD training program for both East Coast and West Coast. Sundance has a bunch of amazing labs, and uh, although most of them are for writing, directing, producing, but they do pair up, um, they do provide crew for those labs, so DPs, editors, costume designers, production designers, also film independent, they have amazing labs as well, and take advantage of those opportunities. That's true, Film Independent has a great program for, and I think they cover, uh, it's not just directors and, um, yeah, on. Project Involved. Project Involved, thank yeah, you. Yeah. I'm a mentor this year. Oh, great. Yeah. So, it's, so it's editors <laughs> and cinematographers it's, it's as well? It's editors, cinematographers, I believe producers, and then writers and directors, I think, yeah. Yeah. Evolve. yeah. yeah, and I will say that, like, so I work at Mar Vista Entertainment. I'm in physical production, and um, often I'm meeting with young people coming out in the industry, and the, these programs help. Mm -hmm. Like, it... It it's, um, definitely helps with visibility, and I think they're pretty good at connecting you after you come out. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys so much for coming out. I want to thank our panelists. Thank you. you guys are awesome. What a great discussion. Thank you.